Hi, my name is Jennifer Cordy. Uh, welcome to the event space. Thank you all for coming here. I'm a professional uh, cityscape and landscape photographer based out of New Jersey. Um, I, rec I recently went full time and I'm going to be explaining my Milky Way and moon photography to you guys. So uh, I'm first going to explain my Milky Way photography, um, how to shoot it, um, planning tips, sample work, and then I'm going to jump right into the moon stuff. So how do I shoot the Milky Way? Um, it's recommended that you have a wide angle of at least 2.8, um, a sturdy tripod that could, that's really good in wind um, and the elements. A wired remote is really good. Um, a big memory card, hiking boots, and a headlamp. That's basically what I use when I'm shooting the Milky Way. OK. So the main thing about Milky Way photography is the theme of imagine, plan, and shoot. And I'm a huge um, believer in photopills. And um, the main theme behind photopills is imagine, plan, and shoot. So the biggest thing with Milky Way photography is composition, know your subject. Before I go out and take a Milky Way shot, I always think, what do I want to shoot? What is the image that I want to show? You have to have that idea in your mind before you even get out there. What do I want to do? Do I want to show the, the Milky Way over a pier? Do I want to show it over a certain rock formation? You have to have that idea in your mind. Once you understand what your com composition is going to be, I usually use photo pills to plan my shot to know if the Milky Way is going to be over that particular subject or not. You have to use the, the photo pills app to, in order to know if the Milky Way is going to be over that, that particular formation at that particular day and time. And then you also have to watch out for light pollution and moonlight. You cannot shoot the Milky Way over 25% moonlight. And you cannot shoot the Milky Way into light pollution. I've seen people do it. I love it when it's dark. So I always plan my shots around getting away from the light pollution. I think that's really, really important. Okay. The main thing with Milky Way photography is you have to get a really good, strong foreground image first, and then shoot the Milky Way. And the, the how I do that is, I'll take a blue hour shot of what I want to shoot, and then I'll leave the camera there and I'll wait. Wait for the Milky Way to come, shoot the Milky Way, and then blend them together in Photoshop later. The reason why I do that is, if you don't take separate shots, your foreground is going to be very noisy. Now, this time of year, the Milky Way rises up right before pre-dawn. What does that mean? I'm not going to stand out there for sunset and wait eight hours in the cold. I'm not going to do that. This time of year, I do the opposite. I take my Milky Way shot, wait for it to get lighter, shoot the pre-dawn foreground shot, and then I take all those images and I blend them later. OK. So again, I talked, talked about composition, know your subject. This was white pocket over the summer. I camped out there, and I wanted to, a shot of a man standing on a rock, or a woman, staring at the Milky Way. That was my thought. What happens is that I changed my mind about what I wanted to show and what rock I wanted to use midway through the night. And if you notice here, my foreground's a little blurry. Now, had I not changed my mind, I could have gotten the blue hour foreground shot, and this would have been in better focus. But again, you're seeing an image, uh, an image that I took after Blue Hour was over, and it's a little bit blurry. Okay. Milky Way season runs from late January until October. The, at the start of the season, the Milky Way actually rises up right before pre-dawn right now. So you have a very short window of time before the, um, to get the Milky Way before it completely fades into the sky. So the, the Milky Way season starts the, the, the last week of January. So you get that really early Milky Way that comes up right over the horizon, right before pre-dawn. And then every minute back from that point, um, the Milky Way actually rises up earlier and earlier as the season goes by. In October, the Milky Way is actually setting at sunset. So if you're out there, it's great for people who don't want to miss sleep. I hear from people all the time, well, can we just get at the end of the season that I can just shoot it after sunset and be done? I'm like, okay, but the best time to shoot the Milky Way right now 
in, in this area is February and March. Why? The Milky Way is actually over the ocean right now in the east. I know this because I shot the Milky Way about four times in the last 10 days, <laughs> okay? Um, so this, the season starts, the Milky Way is right over the ocean. The ocean is very dark. As the season goes by, the Milky Way changes direction from the southeast to the southwest. What's in the west here? Light pollution, the cities. I mean, New Jersey is really heavily light polluted. It's very hard to shoot the Milky Way after the Milky Way shifts into the, the west. Okay, so this is an example of a Milky Way that I shot very early in the season. This is last year, this is in February. You can see how the Milky Way is already fading into the sky. So what, what's happening here is that this Milky Way has come up over the horizon and then daylight's pushing it and then it's making it fade. So this is an example of a Milky Way about two weeks into the season. This is actually a very challenging place to shoot. This is Montauk. What you have to do in Montauk is you have to take several exposures because this lighthouse is so bright. They recently installed these LED lights at the lighthouse, making it almost impossible to shoot at night. This is three images. This is a long exposure foreground image. This is a blended sky, and this is a very short exposure for the lighthouse, and that's all blended together in Photoshop. I just took this a couple of days ago. This is in Avalon, New Jersey. The, the southern New Jersey is a fantastic place to shoot the Milky Way right now. Avalon, Barnegat, all of those southern beach towns are fantastic right now to shoot the Milky Way. Um, again, I took this a couple of days ago. I got the Milky Way right as it was fading. So it, it came up over the clouds, and you can see it already fading into the sky. Okay. So this is an example of the Milky Way led around to the season. Do you see how the, the angle of it has changed? I like to go out west over the summer to shoot the Milky Way because the Milky Way is higher in the sky and it's more vertical because you've got mountains. The Milky Way season out west hasn't even started. So you're thinking about jumping on a plane right now after you've heard my wonderful presentation and heading out west. You're not going to see it yet. This is an example of the Milky Way really late in the season. This is late August. You can see that right after sunset, my Milky Way is already fading into the sky right behind. It's already setting in the sky right after sunset. So again, you've got the, the early Milky Way right before pre-dawn, and then you have the late one in October. So using photo pills to plan your shots. So you download the photo pills app, Drop a pin where you want to shoot. Select the Milky Way filter. Navigate to the date and time. And then look at the large dots to view the Milky Way core. OK, so this is a shot I recently took January 26. You can see here that the Milky Way is already fading. So it just breached the, breached the horizon, and the daylight's fighting it. I actually love this time of year. I love the, I love the, the uh, pre-dawn shot of the Milky Way. So what you do is you open the app, you click Planner, which is this. The planner up there. This is Photo Pills. Then you drop a pin where you want to shoot. Now this is Barnegat Lighthouse. So if you drop a pin where Barnegat is, you navigate to the time, and then you wait for those big dots to show, and that's where the Milky Way core is. But look at this, galactic core visibility 507 to 537 AM. Very little visibility this time of year. OK, so what you have to do is you have to go into the settings and enable Milky Way. And then again, those white dots tell you where you see the core. Also, it's very, very important to understand where the, where the moonlight factors into all of this. So, I plan all my Milky Way shots around the moon. And actually, this week, we're going to have a full moon on Saturday. You can actually shoot the Milky Way up until Friday, because the, um, the, the, the moon is going to set later on in the morning before the Milky Way is actually going to fade. So you can actually shoot the Milky Way up until, um, up until Friday. So I'm going to show you. So this is photo pills. Can you see this? 
Okay. This is um, the 26th. This is the shot that I took in the 26th. So let's look up here where this thing is here. If you see here, um, I had a uh, moonrise at 8.27 a.m. and it was a new moon. And then our, my moon set was 6.55 p.m. That was fine. All right, these twilight times are very, very important. Astronomical twilight is when the Milky Way and stars start to fade from the sky. So you have to know what your astronomical time is. That's critically important. But the best time to shoot the Milky Way is actually when the Milky Way is actually starting to fade into the sky. It's actually quite beautiful because you actually watch the stars and the Milky Way kind of fade in and look kind of watery. It's actually very nice. The nautical twilight is when the Milky Way is completely faded and now you're starting to get pre-dawn. I don't know if any of you guys like to shoot sunrise, but you're typically out there during pre-dawn hours. You're actually out there probably after the Milky Way is faded. So again, the nautical, the nautical time is game's over, like Cinderella's lost her slippers. If you hit that nautical time, you're done. Also, you need enough time for the Milky Way to come into the sky before that nautical time hits. It takes 45 full minutes for that Milky Way to be seen clearly in the sky because it's a planetary object. So you have to plan, if you see the, the, the Milky Way rise time is at five, then at 5.45, you'll be able to see the Milky Way. If that nautical time is 5.45, then you've missed it and don't even leave the house. So using photopills is a fantastic, fantastic tool to, for planning the Milky Way. And also you move the timeline with your finger so you can move the timeline back and forth. I'm just moving it with my finger, okay? And actually you can look at the time and see that it's disappearing right near the nautical time. And then the civil, civil twilight is the time right before uh, sunrise, and then that's it, the new day is started. It's actually quite thrilling this time of year to be out there because you're actually watching the new state they start. And before I started photography, I never really even noticed this. To stand outside and watch the stars fade and the, 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 the new day come in, it's actually quite thrilling. Actually, it's good to be out there on a day that's not that cold <laughs> because if you're out there, you know, in 15 degree weather, it's not very nice. But if you can get out there on a warmer day, it's actually a very nice thing to witness. Okay. Okay, an example of um, a plan that I did. Now, I'm going to go back to my planner. and I'm going to show you later on in the season. Let's go back to this QuickTime here, my, my phone. And I'm going to navigate to later on in the season. So I'm going to go to July. Okay. In July, I have my galactic time, my Milky Way rise time is 10 o'clock at night, and it fades to 2.30. It's visible from 10.05 to 2.34 a.m., okay? So you can see how later on in the season, my galactic core is rising up much, much earlier. And you can see how the angle changes. So if I move my timeline to, hold on one second. If I move my timeline, you can actually see the, the core. You see how the direction of it has changed? So in July, the core is actually above me like this, not over the ocean. Guess what? July is a really, really bad time to be out there trying to shoot it at the Jersey Shore. Plus, you have all those people in LBI partying and whatever. And you have a tremendous amount of light pollution at the shore. So I tell people, you want to shoot the Milky Way at the Jersey Shore, go in February and March. Perfect. It is cold, bundle up, but you'll be definitely rewarded. OK, the Milky Way and light pollution, I think I talked about that. This is, this is uh, New Jersey and New York City. So <laughs> you have a tremendous amount of light pollution right where we're at right now. So the only clear areas now are if you go here, between this down in South Jersey, shoot right over the ocean, and in Montauk. That's about it. And also in Barney, it's right up here. Barney is in that green area. It's kind of depressing, right? Um, also, if you look out west, look at this. A lot of areas that are very dark. 
So if you want to go and shoot the Milky Way later on in the season, I recommend going to Arizona, Utah. There's plenty of places where you can see the Milky Way. Death Valley National Park is fantastic. Okay. I think I talked about this already. Okay, this is an example of a blue hour blended shot. So in April, I went out to Death Valley with a couple of friends of mine, and um, we went on the playa. And I, does, has everyone heard of these rocks, these floating rocks in Death Valley? So what I did was I actually got there before sunset and shot that rock at F8, nice and crisp and clear, and I left my camera alone. I didn't touch it. I waited for Milky Way Rise to come. I set my camera on continuous mode, and I took like, I think 30 to 40 shots of the Milky Way. So this is not, I didn't take this at the same time. This is sunset, and this is laying around at night. Took all those images together, stacked my Milky Way, then blended it together with my foreground shot, and I got that. If you wait at night to shoot your foreground, you're going to have a really hard time focusing at night, especially something close. Also, when you're shooting at f2.8, you're not going to get a very clear image unless you're, you're further back from the rock. There's a lot that goes into it. So I really recommend you using your blending a, 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 um, a uh, sunset shot to get a clear Milky Way. Also, this is the star trails. I actually, I ran my camera for over an hour and I got these star trails, same image. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you guys some of my work from out west. This is a very complicated image to do. I, this is actually several different images combined together because this was way too dark, but I had to get the, I had to get the, um, the Milky Way in, in the water, and I couldn't blend the sunset shot of this because there was no Milky Way yet. So this is sunset, and then this and this is one image, and I had to blend this into this and that. So it was very time consuming. <laughs> As you can see, this was taken in late August, and the Milky Way actually had started to set really, really quickly. This is White Pocket. White Pocket is very high in elevation. So the only time to really shoot White Pocket well is later on in the season when the Milky Way is, high, is higher. Um, this is Valley of the Gods, a very beautiful place, very creepy. I'm not going to go into that right now, <laughs> but it's a very creepy place to be at night, very remote. Um, you have to drive on a dirt road for a long time. Like you're in the middle of nowhere, and it's, if you have to leave in a hurry, then, you know. The problem with Valley of the Gods is that it floods very easily. So if you're going to go out there and you hear storms on the horizon, you cannot attempt to drive in there. I actually almost got caught there and stuck there for a couple of days. Do be really careful. Um, and this is an example of a blended shot. I took the flowers um, at sunset, and then I waited for the Milky Way to come in, and then blended the Milky Way later. Another blended shot. I call this Donald Trump rock. I'm not going to get political here, but it actually looked like tr Donald Trump, so that's my Donald Trump rock. <laughs> uh, this is the southern part of Arizona. Um, this is kind of early in my Milky Way shooting, and I was using light, and it was very, very harsh. I since, you know, wait for do sun the sunset blend, but you can see that it's kind of bright. Here I'm using illumination. I don't do that anymore, unless it's like very low level lighting. I was using a flashlight to illuminate this, and you don't want to do that. You can see the results are very bright. <laughs> um, this is actually one of my only, only images. This is actually a lightning strike that, strike, that struck behind um, uh, in Monument Valley, and then the Milky Way above it. And Nikon actually featured this. Um, I was chosen to be one of the Nikon 100 because of this image. So I actually didn't even realize that I got a lightning strike until I went home and processed it. New Mexico. This is the Jeep I had in Death Valley. So I went to Roswell, New Mexico, and I'm a huge UFO fan. And I kind of grew up watching UFO movies. And I went out to Roswell just to go to a remote ranch and shoot the Milky Way over a ranch sign. So this is the Milky Way in Roswell, New Mexico. This is creepy also. <laughs> and you notice that the, the, the foreground is really noisy because I was so creeped out that I wouldn't stay there and take a long exposure shot. I got out of my car. I shot a 10 second shot. I jumped in my car and left. I was so creeped out. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, this is in Death Valley on the sand dunes. Okay, this is the Avalon. This is in Barnegat again. This is in the morning. This is, um, I think, in March where the Milky Way was a little higher. Um, this is my trifecta. This is in Ocean City, New Jersey. This is actually a confirmed to be a fireball. I actually caught it. I, I, it was um, moonrise, fireball, and then Milky Way rise. And during a polar vortex, I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> um, it was about negative five degrees with the wind chill, and the ocean was freezing. So you should have seen me. I was wearing like five pairs of pants like five tops, I had two jackets on, a face mask, I had like two gloves on, I was freezing. But you can see how the, all the ice was forming at the shore. And then I saw this huge fireball just streak across the sky and I couldn't believe it and I, was ex I, I got it on, I got the, uh, the shot, so that was really cool. I, t I took a group out to Avalon last summer and um, we actually, there was a thunderstorm that was going out to sea and um, the, the group was thrilled because we got the thunderstorm underneath the Milky Way. That was a big thrill. <laughs> yeah. Another shot with the thunderstorm underneath the Milky Way. Oh, this is Barnegat. Avalon. And this is a stack shot, by the way. You can actually get tremendous amount of Milky Way detail on the Jersey Shore as long as you stack. So th I think this was 25 or 30 shots that I stacked. And then I blended in a, a foreground image. And you can see my friends down the pathway there. <laughs> um, this is at the Jersey Shore also. This is stacked. I think this is about 35 images that I stacked together for detail. The friend of mine with her little flashlight. Um, I call this Sunrise Meets the Milky Way and Winds. So I love this shot because you can see the, the red sunrise coming in and then the Milky Way is sort of, you know, leaving the sky. Montauk Lighthouse, I think I showed you this. This is very early in the season. This is actually the third week of January. You can see how the, the daylight's fighting the Milky Way right as it was rising in the sky. I think this was January 21st. This is actually, I think, the very first day that the core was visible over the horizon at sea level. OK. That's it for the Milky Way. Any questions regarding the Milky Way? OK. Now I'm going to talk about how I shoot the moon. And I'm also going to um, show you how I shoot the sun. Does any, is anybody interested in moon photography here, shooting the moon? OK. Um, how I shoot the moon, my gear for shooting the moon, I have a Nikon D500 that I use exclusively just for moon photography. Um, it's a very fast camera, it's a crop sensor. Someone was asking me, um, you were asking me uh, what do I do if I have a full frame camera. If I, I have a D850 that I sometimes use and I put that in DX mode to get more reach. So if you want to learn how to, how to do it on a Sony camera, then you can put your Sony camera in DX mode and then it'll be like a crop sensor camera. Um, I have a Nikon 200 to 500 with a 2x extender that I use almost exclusively for the moon. I'm looking at getting a faster lens when I get some cash. <laughs> I would like to have a better lens to shoot it. Um, also, I, I recommend for shooting the moon a very sturdy tripod. You don't want to show up to shoot the moon with the with a rickety tripod because you're going to have a lot of uh, shake. So I'm a, I, I tell people, you want to shoot the moon, get yourself a really good tripod, and it could be an older one. You can, you can get an older Gitsu, which is, you know, th those are good as well, and, and they're very sturdy. And just keep it right for the moon. You don't have to carry it, like, hiking for five miles. Um, I also use a wire to your girls as well. Okay. So the main thing with shooting the moon is you have to have an idea in your head about what do I want to shoot, okay? What, what do I want to show in my picture? Do I want to show the Statue of Liberty with the, the, with the, with the moon and the crown? Okay. Once you decide on a composition, you have to see if you have a view. 
Now, I use photopills exclusively for my moon planning. You have to see if you have a view. Photopills is not going to show you that. Google Maps is also not going to show you. I always look at Google Maps and I go and check it out myself. Because I remember one morning I had brought a client with me and we went out to Brooklyn. It was like three o'clock in the morning. There was this gigantic yacht right in the way of our shot. I mean, can you imagine just how upset this poor girl came from South Jersey as well? So if you want to shoot the moon, always just see if you have a view. Take a drive, check it out. If you can see it, there could be a tree in the way. Google Maps is not very reliable to see if you have a view. Case in point, a client hired me to shoot the moon over the Chrysler building the other morning. Google Maps showed me that I had a view. It was an old map. I went there about a half hour before she got there, and there was no view. So you really got to check it out. Do your homework before you go. Um, again, I use photo pills. Um, and also, for shooting the moon, you have to shoot the moon extremely fast. You have to shoot it at a second or less. If you shoot the moon with a long exposure, you're going to get a big blur. <laughs> you're not going to be able to see it. It's very challenging, though, to shoot the moon, especially here in New York. It's very, very windy almost all the time. If you get even the slightest little bit of shaker vibration, you're going to have a blurry shot. What I do is, uh, with my extender, I'm at f11. My typical setting is like ISO 800 to 1000. Sometimes it's 3000. 30, I'm sorry, 3200. And then it could be half a second. If there's a lot of there's, if there's a lot of wind, I've actually had to shoot it at like 1 25th of a second in the middle of the night. So I'm bumping my ISO sky high. It's very hard to fix a shaky picture. It is easier to remove noise than it is to fix a shaky picture, believe me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I took this shot in 2016. Um, this, this shot was taken from uh, 25 miles away from the city. Um, at 25 miles away from the city, the city looks very small, but the moon is always the same size. And this is what I tell people, that it's a trick. Because believe, the moon is not that big. So, of course. So, if you're far away from an object, your city looks really, really small. And, but the moon always comes up over the horizon the, the, the same way. So, if I'm standing right across from the World Trade Center, or next to it, if I'm watching the moon cross over the spire, it could take like, a, like two hours if I'm standing right under it. But if I'm 25 miles away, this moon crossed the World Trade Center in four minutes. Four minutes, and that's it. So 25 miles away, four minutes, when you're standing right under it, it could take two hours. Why? Relative distance. You're standing on the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center is huge. That moon's going to be very small, and the, moon, the, the World Trade Center is going to be very big. What happened was I got this shot. I sent it to Cater's News. In the morning, the shot went completely viral all over the world. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. But people actually thought that the moon was actually this big. So this is before moon photography got really popular. So what happened was people got really, really scared. And they started, um, they started running all of these conspiracy theories about this massive blood moon that is coming up to destroy the city. <laughs> okay. So I had to use photo pills. And I actually have a location 25 miles away. And I actually have plotted that line up again. It only lines up over the World Trade Center from there a couple of times a year. So we ran it on, um, we ran it on um, Cater's News, and then all these newspapers picked it up. So I did a very smart thing. I took a picture of the back of my camera to show people this wasn't fake. Well, guess what? People still accuse me of faking this. And I am not the best at Photoshop. I'm good at layering. But you ask me to move, move an object, I, I forget it. I can't do it. So I tell people, like, how am I going to fake the back of a camera? <laughs> okay. So immediately, the image got picked up all over the place. All of these YouTube videos were, were being shown about this incredibly big blood moon overtaking New York. And it's a sign, like, the, the world is ending. And all of these people started calling me that I haven't met since like high school. Like, oh my God, we saw you. You were on a flat earth Bible and this and that. And I'm like, really? So the moon photography, over, uh, moon photography over New York City is very common now. But when this ran four years ago, not a lot of people had shot this 
from this far away. So it was kind of a new thing back then. Actually made the made the cover of the Drudge Report. So there's there's um, Trump, Clinton, and then my shot right under it. <laughs> and this is my friend from England. It had ran in all of the English newspapers, and there he is just showing me the the image from England. I actually got royalties for about three years, so it was pretty good. <laughs> but my family was like, Jen, you know, like you've got all of these crazy conspiracy theorists running your, your, your article all over the place, and they have your name. That's okay, don't worry about it. Okay, so this is another image that I'm quite proud of. Um, this is actually an eclipse that was happening as it was setting behind the Statue of Liberty. So again, know your subject. I had in my mind that I wanted to show a moon that was disappearing under the Statue of Liberty's arm. So it was like the Statue of Liberty had their arm up, and I wanted to show this disappearing moon under it. Kind of like a doomsday scenario. I watched a lot of crazy movies in my lifetime. If I have to tell you, I have to kill you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was shot through a fence over a restricted area in Brooklyn. So this is actually straight through a fence. You can't see the fence lines because it was so far away. And this was shot in high wind. So very, very tricky shot to do. But I had plotted it in photo pills so that I knew the time where the moon was actually eclipsing. And I calculated it so it was directly underneath the armpit of the Statue of Liberty. So what you have to do is you have to know the height of the object in order to plan this. And I'll go over that later. I had a lot of people tell me that this image was fake. Like I said, I'm horrible with Photoshop. I'm only, like I said, I only know how to layer, and that's about it. Um, we, I had a tremendous amount of distortion the day I shot this, and I shot this from about two miles away, so it was that compression of the lens of the moon behind the Statue of Liberty. This is probably my favorite moon shot I've ever shot. Um, this was from, I think, a mile away from the Statue of Liberty, but because I was directly behind it, I was able to compress the moon in and make the moon look really large compared to the Statue of Liberty. Statue, statue. Um, this one, I wanted the moon to be sitting in the crown. So I'm going to explain the photo pulls later. You actually have to know the height of the crown in order to plan this so that you know that the moon is actually going to be right in the crown at that certain period of time. Um, another shot that I took from the same place as the other one with that huge moon, you see the craters. This one was very challenging. It was extremely cold and the winds were horrible. It, this, was, this was taken in about 20 mile an hour winds. I got there at four in the morning and I thought, you know what, this is never going to happen today. <laughs> the moon, it, it's just a tremendous amount of shaking on my lens when I did this. Um, this is Moonset from Brooklyn. Again, this is, I think, about two and a half miles away. The farther I'm away, I'm away from the Statue of Liberty, the bigger the moon's going to look. Another Moonset. So for this one, I wanted, the, I wanted the moon to set, the full moon to set right on the crown. So I had to get the height of the crown to know how to plan this so that I knew that the moon was going to sit on the crown at that particular time. I really like this because it shows, it looks like the people are staring at this gigantic moon, but they're really not. <laughs> it's kind of like this doomsday scenario again. <sighs> Moon in the torch. Uh, zoomed in, that huge moon by the crown. Okay, so this is actually the image that um, I took before. I took the other one that went viral. I'm kind of glad that this one didn't go viral because this looks even worse. This looks like the world is ending in New York right now, doesn't it? So can you imagine if this one ran, then, then it would have been crazy. There was that image again, the super blue blood moon. Actually, if you, if you type in blood moon World Trade Center right now, you, it still comes up with all those YouTube videos of the, all the conspiracy theorists. It's actually quite amusing. It's still up there. 
Um, this was taken from 12 miles away. This was the biggest moon, I think, in 72 years, lined up with the World Trade Center from 25 miles away. So this was really, really an awesome night to shoot. The problem is it was completely overcast. So I got there and I had about five people with me and I said, oh, this is never gonna happen today. Then, oh my God, you couldn't believe this massive moon came up and everyone was screaming, oh my God. It was, it was really amazing. Um, I really like this one because it shows a full moon. Looks like it was, it's about to topple one of the buildings in Manhattan. And I love showing a lot of drama when, um, when uh, I'm shooting the moon. It, to me, like the more drama, the better. And this kind of looks like, you know, doomsday. Doesn't it look like it's about to topple one of the buildings? <laughs> uh, again, 25 miles out, crescent moon or half moon. So if you see this one, I'm actually, the crazy thing with this one is that I shot the moon from like 10 miles out. I got in my car and I drove to Liberty State Park and I got it twice in one night. Why? It took about an hour, over an hour, to reach the spire from Liberty State Park. But from where I was, it took like 10 minutes. So I was actually able to get in the car, and I was actually able to stop and get some coffee and come here and do it twice in one night. 25 miles out, OK. So I took this recently. Um, this is actually a moon set over the Empire State Building. And I wanted to show that I wanted to show the crescent uh, behind the new 100th floor. I think it's 102nd floor observatory on the spire. So I'm going to explain the plotting in a few minutes, but I had to know what the height was of this in order to plan this properly. So it was kind of stressful because I wanted to, I really wanted to kind of show it like right behind it. And you can't be wrong when you're doing this. If if you're wrong and that thing is crossing, there's really no time to move. Um, this is a rail, rail lineup. I think I took this from, I don't know, I might have been in the Bronx, I don't remember. But I got the Chrysler Building and Empire State Building in one shot with the moon. Um, this is for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I really wanted to do this for the, the cause and I wanted to show Crescent Moon sitting on top of the spire of the, the Empire State Building. I actually flew in a helicopter, took shots of the Empire State Building from the helicopter, then, then got off the helicopter in Linden and drove to where this was in one night. It was, <laughs> it was kind of crazy. Huh? Turkish flag? Turkish flag? Yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's another moon set over the Empire State Building. Um, this was taken from Hoboken. Uh, Hoboken is very close to the Empire State Building. So the moon, um, this actually, the rising moon, I think it took um, like 45 minutes from rise to meet, meet the, the top of the spire. I'm just gonna leaf through these. Um, this is my favorite, one of my favorite ones. I took this a couple of years ago and I was actually on a bridge in Kearney and a truck bridge in Kearney and it, was, it had just snowed. So I was on a very narrow pathway on this truck bridge, and I had about this much space to shoot between me and the trucks, and there was a snow drift. What happened was I got there, and that was before I really started using photo pills exclusively and knowing my heights and all that, and I was wrong. So I got there, set up, looked at the moon, saw the moon start to rise, and I went, oh my god, this is not right. <laughs> so I had to take my tripod, and I had to run all the way down the bridge in that snow set up and I barely got it, but I actually, I managed to get the moon as a, as a, as a cross behind the antenna. Um, but that was kind of crazy to be able to land the shot. I ran a video of me standing there with the trucks coming and then my brother saw it and he went, Jen, what in the world are you doing? The trucks must have been like coming like this. I really love this image because um, I actually took this from a crazy place in New Jersey in Kearney, and this is the only image I have where the moon's actually changing color in the image. So the moon was, was changing from red to orange. You can actually see it changing color, so the top is orange and the bottom is red. 
Here's the moon playing peekaboo next to the Empire State Building. I love that it looks like a rogue planet about to destroy the city. <laughs> I also really like this one because it looks like the moon has just, it looks like it's about to topple it. It's like just, just sitting like directly behind it, just like that. Oh, that was like two in the morning when I took this. It was really cold. This was from 12 miles away. That was a very, very thin crescent moon. Uh, this is one of my favorites, um, the moon in the Chrysler building. What happened was that I looked on Google Maps and it looked great. I said to my friend, let's go. It was like 5 in the morning. Again, don't trust Google Maps. Check it out. You got to go and check to see if you have a view. Guess what? 5 in the morning, I drive to Queens. I get there. It's completely blocked with construction. So then I found a way in. And I went around this gate, and I slid in wet concrete, and I just went flying. Like my whole, you could see, my, I was wearing UGG boots, and my UGG boots are covered in wet concrete. But um, I managed to get the moon next to the Chrysler, but I didn't get the alignment that I wanted. I wanted it at the top, but the, unfortunately, it didn't line up. <laughs> uh, this is a moon bow. So the moon is actually reflecting inside the Empty Sky Memorial. Um, this is uh, one of the new buildings in Brooklyn. Baby Moon, this couple hired me to um, shoot the moon behind them. This was very, very hard to do. <laughs> they kept moving, and I only had a couple of seconds to get it, and it was, I, I'm going to try this again, though, at some point. The moon crossing the Crescent Building. The moon behind the Manhattan Bridge the eclipse and then I actually got the moon behind the teardrop memorial so I actually have the sunrise and the moon in one shot. I also use photo pills to shoot the, the sun so I'll just breeze through this. Okay. So I decided that I wanted to shoot the moon and the crown of the Statue of Liberty. So I needed to find if I had a view. And then I had to use photo pulses to help me plan where to stand and get the shot. So this is actually one of my, um, my most difficult images I've ever taken. I took a group there about two weeks ago, and it was we couldn't see it in the sky. The clouds blocked it. So. I wanted to show a very thin crescent moon <coughs> sitting right on the crown of the Statue of Liberty. And I had to be right, because I actually could not even see this moon into the sky until the very last minute. It was too very, very thin to be visible. So I had to know what the height was of the crown in order to input it into my planner to show if the moon is going to be sitting on it or not. So. To get the shot, I had to drop a pin to figure out where I, would, I thought the crescent moon would align. So once you drop the pin, you have to click moon and azimuth and elevation, and then move the moon pin over the object, then click numeric, and then you have to type in the height of the, the object that you want the moon to be in. Okay? This is very, very important. I have a notepad of all of the heights of the Statue of Liberty. So I looked on Google, and it, Google said that the, the crown was 265 feet above, um, high. So if I type in 265 feet in here, it'll actually, and you click fine, it'll actually show me all of the, the times where that, um, that moon is going to be on the crown based on where I was standing. Okay. So I can, let me go to photo pills and I'll show you. I'm going to go back to January 4th, 2019. Okay. 
So I just want to illustrate what these lines mean. The, the teal line is moonrise. The navy line is moonset. The yellow line is sunrise. And the orange line is sunset. And of course, these lines are Milky Way. You're not going to see Milky Way in New York. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so just thought I'd throw that in there. OK. So let's see. When is my, whoops. Sorry. OK. Um, when is my moonrise time? My, this says that moonrise is 6 o'clock in the morning. So I dropped the pin where the moon, where the moon look, looks like it lines up near the Statue of Liberty. Okay? So what I do is I move the timeline around and try to see if there's a reasonable amount of time between moonrise and when I think it's going to cross. So I dropped it. it this says that it's going to cross at 631, but I'm not going to trust myself. I'm going to use the, the planner. Okay? So you click on the, you click on that thing, and then you have to make sure that our sun, moon, and Milky Way is enabled. Okay, click done. Okay. Oops. Oh. Okay. So click find, moon at azimuth and elevation, and then I'm going to take my moon pin and I'm going to drop my moon pin over the. Wow, where is my moon pin? Wow, look at that. My, my multiples wants me to go out west. Oh my God, <laughs> must be a sign. <laughs> No, it's not. I'm actually stuck here, but it's okay. All right, so, wow, I've never seen it do that before. Here's my moon pin, and I'm going to drop it right there, right above the statue. So I basically created a plot line from where I'm going to stand to the crown of the Statue of Liberty. I'm gonna, I don't know why you have, to type elevate, you have to tap an elevation in numeric. And then you go to apparent height and you type in the height of the, the crown. OK, 265 feet. And then I'm going to click that, that, hour, that little um, magnifying glass at the top. But I'm going to change this to 2019, because that's when I took the shot. And I'm going to click that again, and then click Find. OK, this did not give me the, this did not give me the fourth. Why? I didn't drop the pin in the right place. So what I have to do is I have to go back to Planner, and then I have to move my pin over a little bit further away. So I'm going to give it a little bit more space. And then I'm going to say it's going to be like maybe 40, 40 minutes. I'm going to click Find, move it as with an elevation, click on Elevation, click Numeric, and then type in 265. There it is. 1419, that's my plan right there. And you can actually save it by clicking Save, and you can save your plan. So all of my, all of my um, moon images, all, I'm, I'm sorry, all of my planning for the moon is actually planned ahead of time. I don't want to show up somewhere at 5 in the morning and be disappointed because my plan is off. The only way you're going to get disappointed if you use this properly is what? Something's destroying your view like a big yacht. <laughs> Or two clouds. Clouds and uh, something destroying your view is the only thing that's going to really destroy what you want to do. If you use this planner properly, you, you're good to go. OK? So that's it for photo pills. So another one, I uh, wanted the sun to be in the crown. So what you do is you actually drop the sun pin instead of the moon pin and do exactly the same thing. So if I go back to my, my uh, photo pills and then click on the um, find, I'm oh, sorry, no. Sun at azimuth and elevation, it gives me the sun pin. And the sun pin, I drag the sun pin over the statue, and I, get, I do the same thing. So I'll click on elevation, click on numeric. I can type in 265 feet. And it'll tell me when the sun is actually going to be resting in the crown by doing this. 
This is actually a very powerful tool. And I was actually, I had somebody join me for a Milky Way class two nights ago. And he's a wedding and portrait photographer. And I told him that he can use this to actually plan his portraits so that you know where the sun is going to be at a certain period of time. It's really important to know where the sun's going to be. Especially if you're doing a wedding and you're photographing the bride and groom, you, want the, you, want the, you don't want the sun to be right behind them. You want the, it, the sun to be off from them so that it will be illuminate them really nice. So this is actually a very powerful tool even if you don't you do landscapes and you do portraits. Knowing where the sun's going to be is very important. Same thing. There it is. Okay, and uh, that's it. <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions regarding what I went over? I know I went through a lot. So, using like calculating the height of your objects, are you also have to take your own height? Like yes, that's a good point. So, I'll go back to. Um, if you're on a hundred foot bridge, <laughs> yep. Them? I'm gonna go back to um, one of them, and I'll tell you. This one. I was shooting this from an elevation of about 150 feet. So um, the 102nd um, floor observatory, I think, is at, um, I can't remember what the top of the head. Say if, if it's at 1,100 feet. You have to subtract 150 feet from 1,100 when you're doing this. Most of my shooting is at sea level, and I don't have to worry about it. But if you're shooting from elevation, then you definitely have to subtract your height. I like um, Eagle Rock is a place that I go to all the time to shoot the moon. Eagle Rock, I think, is 650 feet. You have to subtract 650 feet from your calculation, or you'll be you'll be completely off. Okay. Does anyone um, have if yes? You, uh, use photo pills. Is there any need to continue to use TPE? TPE is another a program that you could use. It's very similar. I use photo pills because I like to use the planner, and I like to input the height. Because I do workshops and I, you know, it's important for me to bring people along then, you know, to know that I'm right. Um, before I was using photo pills for that, I, would, I brought people along the very beginning and I wasn't right and we, have, we had to move. Now I know that I'm right and we don't have to move by using the photo pills. But also, TP is also a good program to use. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay, is there yes. A resource? Oh, sorry. oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. You can oh, finish your question. Is there a resource um, for object heights? Yes. Yeah, I mean, Google, um, actually, uh, TPE has a height in there. I think Photopulse has it, but I have, to, I have to see where it is. But in TPE, if you drop a pin on TPE, it'll tell you what the elevation is. I'm always thinking about elevations when I'm trying to plot my shots because it helps me know if I have a view. Like in western New Jersey, there's places that are on a higher elevation than, than anything in front of it. If I look at the elevation somewhere in Western Jersey and I see that there's nothing higher in front of it, then I know that I have a view. Of course, you have to drive there and check it out, of course. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, where do you get the photo pill from? From the App Store? Yes. The photo pills is downloaded from the App Store. Is, is the, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh huh. Is, is, is the uh, color of the moon, is that natural? Red? Yeah, the, the color of the moon is actually always red if it's rising up at night from the horizon, always. It starts red, it goes to orange, then it turns to yellow, and then it turns to white. I have people say, I'm looking at the moon right now and it's white. Why is your image red? I actually get these kinds of questions. And I say, well, <laughs> the moon was close to the horizon when I took it, but two hours later, you're looking at it now and it's actually white. So, OK. <laughs> you have a question? When you input the height in photo fields, are you looking for alignment with the base or the center of the moon? Um, if I want to align the, if I want to align the moon for the center of the statue of liberty, is that your question? Like, um, no, really. Like, I'm not sure if it aligns with the bottom of the moon or the center of the moon. Uh, so, if you you want the the center of the moon to be aligned with the crown of the statue. Uh, yeah, that's kind of like, I think there's a way in Photopulse to do that, but I have to look. You could probably, you could probably um, contact Raphael and he'll tell you how to, how to do that. That I haven't done. I just kind of assume that, the, that it's going to reach. Now, uh, that, actually, that's interesting. Um, if, if I'm in putting 265 into there, then the, the moon is actually going to cross the top of the crown. So, so it's the base of the moon. 
I think it's the base of the moon, yeah. But you I mean always leave yourself a little bit of leeway to move if you don't like the shot. Like Liberty State Park is fantastic because you can you can run around. Like if I'm wrong, I can easily go. Oh, let's let's just walk this way. Or let's walk that way. Some places you don't have any room. Like when I went to shoot the this shot was actually shot through a fence, and it, it was actually taken from Weehawken through a fence. There's an elevated area in Weehawken where you can shoot. I had to shoot this through the through the fence, and I had very little room. I was actually shooting this through a tree. So in some places you can move, and in some places that you can't. So, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. moon and the sun pictures blend it also? I know, I don't blend any of my moon and sun images because I don't want people to accuse of it being fake. All of my moon and sun shots are one shot. The Milky Way stuff you have to blend because the Milky Way is a, is a very distant object, and you have to take it at a very high ISO, and you can't take it more than like 10 or 15 seconds, so you have to blend your foreground shot, but the moon stuff is all one shot. If you try to blend these together, you can always tell. I tell people that I can spot it a mile away. I don't know why. The only thing with this is I had to bring up the shadows of the Empire State Building later in post, so these do require some post work. So this is kind of tricky. You have to expose to the moon when you're doing this. So if you expose for the, for the Empire State Building, your moon's probably gonna get blo completely blown out, okay? Does anyone have any more questions, or? So what's the time exposure? It depends on the light and the wind. If you have no wind, it's like, ah, oh, it's great. If I go there, the wind is calm, I can shoot it up to a second. If the wind is bad, I've gone up to 30 seconds um, shooting the moon. I always take test shots and zoom in in the back of my camera and see if my moon is, my, uh, my moon is blurry or not. The, my, the, to me, wind is my biggest nemesis, especially during the winter time. It is the bane of my existence. I've gone out there at three in the morning, and the wind is so bad, I've just gone home. So, <laughs> does anyone have any more questions? Or I think it's great what you've done, going from pursuing your passion and then getting recognized for it, from, from not uh, I mean, I've followed you on New Jersey photographers for a couple of years or whatever it's been. Well, thank you. <laughs> Well, all of that. That's pretty cool. Thank you very much. I mean, I love it. So I love, I, I, I'm all about teaching others right now. I'm not, it's not about me anymore. It's about, you know, having other people get the shot. And if you see here, most of my images here is when I had clients with me, workshops, or this one, I actually had a private client who hired me for her to get the shot. This is actually a huge thrill because she wanted the moon behind that observatory and we got it. But this required a lot of planning. If you're not, if you don't input your numbers right, it's almost impossible to get the shot unless you have a mile room to run. Like, who wants to be running with the camera? Like, I've done that before, and it's really, really, it's, it's, it's really, really tough to do that. You have a question? What lens do you use for this picture? Um, the, the Nikon 200 to 500. So it's a 5.6. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a faster one. I really can't justify the cost right now because the lens I want is like $12,000. So I, my clients bring it, and I just look at it like, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, like, I can't justify spending $12,000. Like, these are all taken with, like, a $1,000 lens, so. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what? My luck, I rent it, and I get clouded out, because I get clouded out, like, 80% of the time. So <laughs> does anyone have any, any other questions? You can ask me anything, really, before we, we, we end this. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. I hope you guys got some good information from it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yes. How do we find out about workshops that you run? Yeah, actually, the um, you can email me. I have my contact information at the end of this. Oh, okay. Let me just let me just uh, put it up here so you guys can. Uh, yeah, but you can email me. That's probably the quickest way to. Okay. Up there it is. You can just send me an email, jennifercordy at yahoo.com, and then I'll answer it right away. And if anybody needs a copy of these presentations, I, feel free to contact me and I'll send you one. Just be patient. Sometimes I forget or I'm busy and all that, but I'll send you the PDF um, via WeTransfer, and then you can look at it. But the major thing that I like to show people is how to plan it, because it, it really took me a long time to really understand how to use photo pills. But now that I really know how to use it, it's improved my photography like a 1,000%. 
Because who, who wants to be wrong? I mean, if you know you're right, if you do the math, then you get there and go, okay, I know the moon's going to do that. And I, have, I actually had one guy say, you're off, Jen. That moon's not going to cross. I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> All right, let's see. <laughs> I should have had him buy me dinner because I was right. <laughs> but um, does anyone have, yes? Liberty Star Park is very safe because they have cops there constantly. Exchange Place, Exchange Place to me is not safe anymore. I've been out there in the middle of the night, and that, that's a very bad place to be in the middle of the night. But Liberty State Park, of course, is not open past 10 o'clock, but Liberty State Park is very safe. There's a lot of cops there all the time. The cops harass you by being there so super early in the morning, the park is actually closed? Um, you can't be there before 6 or you will get a trespassing charge. So I will not enter the park before six. I will not get out of my car before six o'clock. So if you go to that park before six o'clock and get out of your car, you'll probably get a trespassing charge. So I'm not, I'm, I don't mess with that. I've gotten a couple of tickets over the years and I'm like, I no. Like, like Bontoc, you can't park your car there at night anymore without a, you need a stargazing permit for there. You have to go, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's like, I guess looking at the stars is not free anymore, but I think they're trying to limit the amount of people who are parking there at night because I think there was some bad stuff that was going on there. I don't blame them, but at the same time, I mean, I, our dark sky should be free. We shouldn't have to pay for it. That's all I think anyway, but I'm very opinionated, so. <laughs> um, does anyone have any other questions or? Thank you. You're welcome. Hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much.